Okay, I'm uh, really pleased to introduce Pam Smith to you all today. Um, she's an extremely accomplished uh, botanical ecologist. I met Pam, I think three years ago at an Audubon uh, trip to the Pawnee National Grasslands. And it was just uh, such a treat to be in the same car or near her as she talked about just about anything. Um, she is at the Colorado Natural Heritage Program in Fort Collins um, and uh, has been there for 10 years. She also has been for 10 years a, a forensic botanist with the Necro Search International. Um, so one of the things she mentioned to me the other day is that the Fisher's Peak money didn't come through this year uh, until just about a week and a half ago, I think. So uh, what she'll be uh, telling us about is the work that was done in 2019 and 2020, but they will be jumping back into the field in 2022. And then one last comment I'll make is she's gonna talk about a mouse too. It couldn't get any better. The New Mexico jumping mouse, which is endangered and has showed up uh, with the surveys that they've all been doing at Fisher's Peak. So without further ado, Pam, I hand it over to you. Okay, you have to give me just one more minute. My work computer crashed. I just have to get my thumb drive uh, from the other room and bring it back in here and pull it up on the screen and share our screen. Okay, I'll, I'll try to think of something to say. Tell so a couple of jokes or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if any of you have had the chance to visit Fisher's Peak. Um, basically, ooh, I forget the size, she'll be telling you, but a small part of it has been opened up with trails and I did get to go and check that out in uh, May. And uh, it's just uh, incredible, uh, fantastic habitat, really high quality pinion juniper, and then this iconic Fisher's Peak in the background. So I encourage you, uh, it did motivate me to buy a years long uh, Colorado Parks uh, pass. And now I'm trying to make use of it and go to as many as I can. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, Really grateful that Pam was uh, able to come through and, and give us a talk. Thank you for waiting, everybody. It is it's such an honor and a pleasure to present to the Boulder Audubon Society, albeit I'd rather it be in, per in person, but I'm um, very excited to share with you a uh, biodiversity study at Fisher's Peak State Park that we conducted between the years of 2019 and 2020. And as Karen mentioned earlier, we were supposed to be out there this summer, but the money came in a bit late, so we'll be out there again next summer. I'm excited. I thought I'd have a little more information for you. Um, but just before we get into the uh, program, I want to talk a little bit about the Colorado Natural Heritage Program and our ranking system, because when I talk about some of the plants and animals that we found, uh, I kind of want you to understand what their level of rarity is and how that relates to some species we're going to talk about. So CNHP is nonprofit. We write all our own grants. We track and rank Colorado's rare and imperiled species and habitat. And we provide information and expertise to promote, to promote conservation. And aside from that, we have a number of services. We conduct biological monitoring, research mapping, conservation planning services, and a bunch of other things as well that you can find on our website that I don't have time to go into here. And uh, we usually work with state, federal, and local uh, agencies. All of our data uh, for Colorado goes into the NatureServe database. I don't know if any of you ever used NatureServe Explorer, but all 50 states have natural heritage programs, and we all collect data the same way and feed into the same um, database. And not only is it all 50 states, but there are 30 plus territories and provinces. So it's a North and South American uh, database. So that, I want to show you what that database looks like a little bit because I'm going to be using uh, those rankings. Um, so if we pulled up one of the rarest species we found at Fisher's Peak State Park, the Papillon Goldenrod, uh, you can see we ranked it a G2S1. And I want you to understand what that means. Uh, on NatureServe, when you pull it up, even common species are on there. But for all the plants, you can find out what their global rank is. That's what G means, global rank. And um, G1 is critically imperiled. It's the rarest of the rare, other than things that are either extinct or possibly extinct, which are rank, ranked GX and GH. Um, then we go down, uh, G1 is critically imperiled. Uh, G3 is vulnerable. G4 is apparently secure. And G5 is secure. 
And a number of species uh, don't have a status rank either due to lack of information um, or knowledge about the species. It, this uh, website also has a lot of information. Here's a distribution map by state. So it shows Colorado and New Mexico are the only locations in the world that we know of for the Catalan goldenrod. Um, and it's considered critically imperiled in both Colorado and New Mexico. But I just wanted you to see how that works. The state ranks are here on the side bar here, and they're very similar to the global ranks. So in Colorado, it's actually considered critically imperiled and in New Mexico as well. You can see the rank here, secure would be a G5. So that's a really quick lesson on how our ranking system works. So let's get into the, the good stuff. Let's say we were headed down to Fisher State Park right now to go hang out. We would just get on I-25 and get off at exit eight. Um, that's where the Fisher State, State Park office is. Office is. It's almost exactly eight miles from the border with New Mexico. So it's pretty far down there. And it butts up against another state park in New Mexico called the Sugar Lake Canyon State Park. So that's nice to have some extra open lands attached. Uh, Fisher's Peak State Park is in Los Angeles County. Um, and now you can see an outline of the park here. Um, it's five and a half miles uh, southeast of the town of Trinidad. You can see how it's located in the county here. Okay, so this is a, a diagram I, I stole from the Fisher's Peak Master Plan, just so you can see what's going on there right now. The whole park is not open to the public, only a little swatch of it that they call the sneak peek location. About 250 acres is open to the public and closed for a little while due to some flooding. And then it opened back up. And there's about a three quarter of a mile trail here. Um, I did research before this trail was a thing. And so I've never actually been on it, but I know Karen Meany has, and she said it was lovely. Um, but I just wanted you to know that's the status right now. Uh, the whole park is 19,200 acres or about 30 square miles of pretty rugged landscape. Uh, the eastern border is I-25, and which Raton Creek also runs alongside the border here. And then, as I mentioned, Sugar Wright Canyon in New Mexico on the south. But to the east, there's two state wildlife uh, areas that also add a large area of public open or public land, the James and John and the Lake Dorothy State Wildlife Area on the eastern boundary. NAMI's eastern boundary, these big white swatches are giant mesas, um, Fisher's Peak Mesa, it's called. Beautiful Fisher's Peak is up here. For a total now of about 35,500 square acres or 55 square miles of public lands in that area now. That's pretty incredible. So, Fisher's Peak, of course, is an iconic landscape that you can see for miles once you hit southern Colorado. Um, the peak is 9,633 feet in elevation. It is the highest point in the United States east of its longitude. And it's the highest point in the Raton Range. It's a pretty interesting uh, place. So if you start out at the park office and decide you're going to walk up to the cliffs, you will have to travel about 3,000 feet in elevation and about three or so miles, depending on where you go up. Considering, I mean, even if you could, could traverse the landscape, it's a pretty amazing and rugged landscape. A lot of it's not safe to be on in terms of loose rock and scree. Um, I was going through my pictures and I thought, who took an airplane ride across the park and realized it was my own picture from our SUV as we were driving along to get to some of our sites. But it's pretty amazing to get up into the high country at Fisher's Peak State Park. Here we are. You know, I, I call on roads loosely when we were doing the study. Uh, some of these hadn't been driven on in many, many years and you needed a person who could operate a chainsaw. I don't know how many times we stopped, more than 10. Um, just to go just a half a mile sometimes. Uh, it's crazy surveying a wild space that really hasn't been uh, developed in many years. And then you get out of your SUV or off your trail and it is bushwhacking. It is serious terrain out there, not to mention a lot of the shrubs are quite thorny and there's a lot of stinging metals. <laughs> Trails are good. I just wanted to give you another view of just how rugged the terrain is at Fisher's Peak. You can see the eastern boundary is quite rugged itself. There's some serious topography, slows down a tad bit in the middle, and then picks up again on this western boundary as you approach the big mesa. Here's Fisher Peak Mesa right here. And also notice all the streams and drainages and things that are uh, coming down to the Breton Creek from Fisher's Peak. 
Okay, when we first started working out there, it wasn't Fisher's Peak State Park. It was the Crazy French Ranch. And uh, Crazy French is the name that was given to the man who bought this property over 100 years ago. They thought he was crazy because um, who would buy this piece of land? There isn't very much water resource available for agriculture or cattle. So they thought that he was playing nuts. And thus the Crazy French Ranch. And they must have embraced the name been private for over a hundred years and October 2020 it became our second largest state park. It didn't happen overnight. It was a collaboration of individuals and uh, groups um, that started even before 2017. The city of Trinidad, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, Great Outdoors Colorado, and the Trust for Public Lands were very instrumental in getting this property for us all. This is a look at what we think Fisher's Peak might have looked like around 1900. Fisher's Peak is not a pristine landscape. Um, back in the 1900s, it was almost completely logged for a booming coal industry that needed wood for towns and railroads. And so a lot of the, what is now Fisher's Peak State Park was logged around the turn of the century, but not much has happened since then. And the result is an amazing forested shrubland, grassland landscape that has healed uh, from that phase of clear cutting. Another view, beautiful photo. Looking north towards the peak. So our project goals were pretty simple. We wanted to identify places where sensitive habitats and at-risk species are. Sounds pretty simple, but when you have a landscape like that, you have to do some homework. Um, southeastern Colorado isn't as well studied as other areas, and there's basically almost no data from the fish from the Crazy French uh, Ranch because it was private. Um, so we had to do a lot of work ahead of time and pick where we wanted to go and figure out how the heck we were going to get there. And then we set out to document the locations and conditions of the uh, rare plant, animals, and plant communities that we found, and all this information is being used for the Conservation Action Plan and the master plan development for the park. So here's the results. Blam, 454 plants are on our plant species list. Many contributors other than CMHP um, and 186 animals. CMHP did a lot of work, but we also had professionals helping us out there as well. So for the botanical resources, 14% um, of our uh, of the species in Colorado um, which is there's 3,276 3, species in Colorado. 14% of them were found in just 0.4% of the land area, uh, which is Fisher's Peak State Park. So that tells us already this is a very biodiverse property. And among those, we have 13 CNHP tracked rare plants, three rare plant communities, and seven endemic species. The wildlife resources were pretty diverse as well, with 83 insects, 76 of them butterflies and 71 birds, 15 mammals, 10 mollusks, 4 reptiles, 2 oodnets, 1 amphibian, and a partridge in a pear tree. Um, you'll notice that very light on the wetland species because there's not a lot of wetland resources in the two oodnets. Um, some of it's just not getting to the right area. It's a big land area. There's much more to discover. These plant lists are probably not complete by any means. And, uh, Karen mentioned in the beginning, we're going to talk about a mammal species, a little jumping mouse, the New Mexican meadow jumping mouse. I left out the word meadow, um, but it's a, a ESA, endangered species, uh, under the ESA rule. Jumping mice are interesting little creatures. And the other thing that tells us this, plant, this area is fairly well recovered is that there are only 10% non native species. I don't know how many of you have been involved in doing plant lists or studies, but in my experience, it's pretty rare to find any large land area with 10% of the plant list being non-native species. Usually it's about 15, 20, maybe 25 to get closer to bigger cities. It can get up to like 50% non-native species. So this is pretty incredible. And less than 2% of those are listed noxious weeds, like this musk thistle here that this butterfly is visiting. John Sobel, our butterfly guy, and I had a conversation about how often we see butterflies on mock thistle. So the end result is to help land managers plan. There are other people that were doing vegetation surveys and we were citing our wildlife observations and our plants. And we were also looking at old growth forests. What, how could there be old growth? 
Well, it hasn't been touched in over 100 years, and we were finding a number of species that had little wooden, well, patches of old growth woodlands coming back. So that was really exciting. Um, so we're going to start out with botany, but as promised, I'm going to talk about other creatures that we found there um, over our two-year study. It was really fun to not only have professional botanists out there, but some of the interns who are very enthusiastic at helping us with botany and entomology and all the other things. Um, I'd like to call out a couple of people that were very helpful. Dina Clark, um, she was a she was a plant collecting fool out there. Um, she's from the University of Colorado Boulder. If you don't know who she is, she's probably one of the best botanists, if not the best botanist in the state, along with Jennifer Ackerfield uh, from Denver Botanic Gardens and Steve Olson, right down here on the bottom here, Steve, Jennifer, and Dina. Steve is from the US Forest Service and he recently retired from the Pike National Forest. So um, these three people are very familiar with uh, Southeastern farming in Colorado. So these diverse landscapes are also what contributed to our large plant list with the forests, woodlands, grasslands, wetlands, streams, and rock outcrops, all of which you can see in this photo actually. It is a little pond right here. And these grasslands that kind of dot the landscape are extremely important for wildlife and butterflies and uh, plants as well. These edge habitats are uh, part of what adds to the biodiversity of the place and make it really special along with the cliffs, cliffs and the nature parks and the shrublands as well as woodlands. So let's start with a plant, a rare, another rare plant, horrid herica, herica, horrid herica. What a horrid name for this plant. It's actually a sweet little blue aster, kind of a perennial shrub, shrub, shrub thing. Um, it's considered globally vulnerable because it's only known from Colorado and in Mexico. And we found it mostly in areas with older growth trees, including uh, pine pines and ponderosa pines. And it's considered a swap tier two species. I don't know how many people have heard of this, but this is a Colorado um, uh, way that we rank plants. The State Wildlife Action Plan uh, is used to the plan that was written to identify species of statewide concern and also endemic. So tier two and tier one species are the species of highest concern. We will discuss a couple more species in that line. So here's the distribution of horrid herithia. Only Los Animas County in Colorado and it gets down into, to into New Mexico and it's usually associated with the Baton Range. Another beautiful set of photos. The only reason and I think it's called Perichia horrida is because the leaves are tiny bit prickly. I mean, they don't even hurt and they're kind of glandular, but that's the only, I couldn't find anything in the literature, literature as to why it was named that, but that's the only thing I can come up with. And it's found between 5,500 and 9,000 feet. And again, in the, near, near the vicinity of Gretchen. There's some other names in the literature if you read older taxonomic treatments, Aster horda, Eurydia horda, and Herithia. Turkey is the one that's accepted now. This is the habitat where we had to look for it. Um, it's steep, a lot of loose soil, kind of limestone kind of habitat where we find this wonderful plant. The other thing that I put this picture in to remind everybody, when we find a rare plant and put a dot on the map, we need to protect more than just that dot because we need to think about pollinators. And what does that pollinator need to survive? Like this flathead wood borer. Um, it might be pollinating this plant right here. They are um, aster specialists, but they also need woody plants as well for their larval stage. And so you have to make sure that you preserve that habitat too and don't fragment that and just only protect the area where you find a rare species. So this was the species I brought up in the very beginning, the Cagadin goldenrod. It's probably our rarest plant species. Uh, at Fisher Peak State Park G2S1. They're um, globally um, in the Herald and State for the Fleeting Herald. Saladago capulinensis. My picture on the right, I apologize, it's blurry, unfortunately. Um, it's a rare plant, there's not that many pictures of it, so you're stuck with my blurry picture, but it's a little golden rod. It can get uh, much taller than that. It's a dry year, the years that we did the survey, but it also liked areas with older growth junipers. In the area that this was discovered by Dina Clark in 2019, um, it was Juniperus monosperma, or the one seed juniper, along with oaks and ponderosa pines. 
So the only distribution to this plant in Colorado is down here. Here's Los Angeles County, and here's still four dots, and then there's one sneaking over here in the Baca County. So if we look at it from the air, here's uh, Fisher's Peak right here. We're being a discovered our patch at Fisher's Peak State Park. The other known locations are from Mesa de Maya, that's that one from Baca County, and the original population that was discovered. I think the plant was described in 1936, but I don't think anybody really uh, accepted it till a paper was purchased or purchased, published in 2011. And it was at Capulin Volcano National Monument. Now the name starts to make sense. Uh, Saladago Capulin Mentis. And you can see this, this plant must be attractive to the Mesa type habitat because you really don't find it anywhere in between in this other area. So it's interesting. I'm not talking just about rare plants. Some of the plants that were just crazy fun out there included uh, the violet wood sorrel or Oxalis violacea. It kind of looks like a little clover. Um, you want to call it a clover, but it's really in the Oxalidaceae. It's a wood sorrel. And uh, it has flowers very different from any clover you would ever see. Uh, it's known from Teller County South in Colorado, from about seven counties, and from seven to 9,000 feet. And it's not that common. Um, this is the NatureServe map of Oxalis violacea. It says it's, they give it a G5, but you can see it's extirpated from Michigan, and it seems to be viable in uh, these states here in the light blue states. It hasn't even been ranked in all of these states, and it seems to be in trouble in these northeastern states. So sometimes the rankings aren't kept up to date because of lack of information. You can see it gets quite big. It'll get up to 16 inches tall. So it's a pretty exciting to see it. Sometimes the undersides of the leaves turn red. Um, we found it not only in the woodlands, but in prairie type habitats as well as on the coast. Another fun one that we would squeal when we got to see was Scott Clematis, Clematis scottii or Scott sugar bowl. Very interesting, uh, beautiful plant. It's different from the more common Clematis that we know from the north, uh, Clematis persistima. Um, some people recognize this as a variety of that. Um, but it's, it's quite a bit different. It's actually bushy. And you see the elevation from 55 to 10,000 feet. It's not ranked in Colorado. That's fun. It's too fun. It's the bushy appearance of it. Most clematis are vining plants. So it's really fun to come across that one. It's kind of a robust, herbaceous plant. So let's talk about our older growth woodlands that were out there. Um, very special places. And we found old growth, either woodlands or specimens of many different kinds of trees, including ponderosa pine, gamble oak, dug fir, pinion pine, and Mexican locust, white fir, Rocky Mountain juniper, and cottonwood. And older growth forests are way different than successional stage forests. They offer a whole different set of habitats for organisms. There's more fallen trees. The, the overstory is higher. They can accommodate different types of birds and um, animals. The root mass is different. Um, this leads to greater varieties of nutrients. The way the soil drains is different and how it's aerated is different. You have a larger biodiversity of habitats, which means a greater biodiversity of organisms and a different array in some instances of species that are found in the forest. There's a lovely photo that Dana Clark took of Man Letter from C. Boulder or Variant. I think she's retired. And then Mike Figs was one of our drivers out there. He's the chainsaw man. So let's talk a minute about the New Mexican locust woodland. This place is crazy. Usually we think of New Mexican locusts as small trees or shrubs even. It's native to southern Colorado, but it's considered introduced further to the north. Um, the woodlands weren't bad to go through. The shrublands are awful because this is a very thorny species of locust. Uh, the thorns are at least a half a, you know, a, an inch to a half an inch long and they're woody and hard. Um, but what we found is the New Mexican locusts across Fisher's Peak State Park was in different phases depending on if there had been a fire or not. It comes in uh, quite strongly after fires. But some of the woodlands, they did some tree cores and the Nature Conservancy and other folks were looking at aging some of these trees and came up with ages of about 105 to 108 years old. And some er other areas are suspecting some are in excess of 150 years old. So that's kind of fun. Um, these, uh, this prolific flowering shrub is also a low larval host for a couple of different butterflies. 
and honeybees and native bees as well. And very ecologically important. This is the nature serve rank for it, which is interesting that it's a G4, not ranked in Colorado, but in Texas, um, Utah, and California is considered critically imperiled, and it hasn't even been analyzed in other states. I don't think it's rare in Colorado. I can switch though. Very good diversity of oaks at Fisher's Peak State Park. Four, that's a lot, including the gray oak, which is only known from Los Angeles County, Perfect Rubia. Kind of looks a little bit like a, a live oak with a little leaves here. And then the Sonoran scrub oak, Perfect Turbinella, looks a little bit like a holly with oak fruit. And then the gamble oak, which we're all pretty much familiar with around the Boulder area in the south or further south. Um, the wavy leaf oak is actually a hybrid between Gandalii and Carcus turbinella, and that's called Carcus pausoloba, and that's also a fisher specific part. It looks kind of fun to play around with some of the oak diversity there. So, um, this is an interesting picture of an area that had burned about 10 years ago at Fisher Peak State Park. This understory is all the New Mexican locusts coming back in its shrubby form. And you can see it's healing very nicely from the burn. There are all kinds of different forbs in here. You can see, um, I think that Mike is there and Dina again hanging on. It's seriously steep right here. I mean, you can hardly stand up right here. It looks like you can, but you can't. As you get, uh, as you approach the base of the cliff, it's seriously steep. And then you end up with this cliff. And notice these people walking the cliff here. It looks like it's an easy walk, but notice everybody's got their hands hanging on. To the side of the rock here. That's because this you could fall down. I almost slipped down this. It is incredibly steep as you approach the wall. And the cliffs look like just big areas of rock, and there's not much going on there in terms of plants and animals, but nothing could be further from the truth. And at Fisher's Peak State Park, some of the coolest things we found were found among the cliffs, including a variety of bat, a peregrine falcon, and an eyrie. Um, a number of rare plants, 13 and 14 of them, and a contingent of alpine species at 9,600 feet. So, what the heck? It's an incredible place. So, King's Crown, Sodiola, not very rare, but at Fisher's Peak Park, it's growing in rock property. When you read the description for this plant, it says streams and wet meadows from 9 to 14,000, and then alpine rock growth. Well, the elevation is still okay. It's just barely above 9,000 feet, but this is a rock garden. So it's kind of an interesting habitat to see it in. And this is it just perched up on the rocks. So you can see that there's lots of plants. Uh, James and Americana shrub here growing uh, on the This is how I typically see King's Crown in a wet meadow up at Alpine. This isn't from Fisher's Peak State Park. This is an Alpine setting. That's typically what I think of when I see it. So it was pretty fun to see it. Of growing out of rock crops, outcrops, or species. So these outcrops offered more interesting things, um, including this endemic species, uh, Smith's Grava, Grava Smith's eye. Um, it's usually found from 7,700 to 12,000 feet, so it can go as high as alpine. It's got a very limited distribution because it's only on talus and spree, but in Colorado, it's only found in a few counties, and there's been one sighting. Uh, in Taos County, New Mexico. So it's critically imperiled in New Mexico and imperiled in Colorado. Gravers are tiny little mustards. They often have little flowers and kind of cool little fruits. Some, some of them are kind of a little twisted. Okay. Fun to see those on the rock faces. But one of the weirdest things um, Dina found was Baker's Alpine parsley, Rhinoceros Baker eye. Um, Jennifer Eckerfield lists the elevation to be 12,000 to 14,000 feet. So, what the heck is it doing there? Uh, another endemic species, we consider it uh, globally and state uh, vulnerable, or PMHP. It's known for more southern counties in Colorado, and it's also known for Utah and New Mexico. But it's kind of fun to start seeing this weird little alpine contingent on the list of species. It's really a beautiful place and people are going to want to be there and people are going to want to climb these rocks. It's going to be an incredible management challenge to protect uh, the rare plants and uh, animals that like to hang out. And the more stabilized the rocks are, the better they are for climbing and the better they are for hosting rare 
and I can now walk through here. So that's going to be an interesting thing. And from Fisher's Peak, it's interesting while you're climbing up there, you can see another iconic view uh, off to the, the west, and that's the Spanish Peak. So from one icon to the other. Kind of place. Not all the cliffs or steep areas are even navigable, which makes doing a full biological inventory quite difficult. Some places are downright dangerous. There's another view of the Mesa Top. These are very spectacular, magical areas that uh, form the eastern boundary of Fisher's Peak State Park, which just barely gets over onto some of these large uh, mesas. As you approach the top of the cliff, you, you travel all day, you feel like you've got to the top of a mountain, you get up there, and here you are. It feels like you're out on a Pawnee Buttes or something. It's like we just climbed a mountain. How are we in the grasslands? Age. These grasslands are spectacular uh, grasslands, very biodiverse as well, including a couple of rare plant species, the marsh meadow Indian paintbrush, which is globally apparently secure and safe um, in peril. Um, Indian paintbrush is this lovely number down here with the yellow flowers, Castalesia lineata. The Castalesias are often hemiparasitic, which means they can survive not only using chlorophyll, but they can also switch or do both parasitic type work and, and get some nutrients from some of these plants in the vicinity. As you look around this picture, notice all the color and forbs and the diversity that's in this picture here. And amongst the forbs, there's this rare little sedge. A lot of sedges are typically wetland species. Um, this is an upland sedge that we track uh, as um, an endemic species. It's globally vulnerable and in peril in Colorado. Sterix oreocarus is a vacuum cloaked sedge, a nice little bunchy type of sedge that was um, locally common uh, on Fisher's Park. So, a lot of the mesa tops that you're seeing have carried oak grass on it, which is um, the Latin name is Danzonia carii. But the grassland is actually tracked as a community. The plant's not tracked as a community. And the community is considered globally very. Um, vulnerable and safe and feral. In Wyoming, it's considered to be safe, earthy, and feral. In Colorado, this grassland is largely known from the Front Range area. And unfortunately, most of the known sites have been altered by improper grazing and aren't in very good condition, like these are on the top. Uh, Perry's oak grass is, is mm, fairly sensitive to grazing. It's not as sensitive as some species, but it's sensitive where it will not handle overgraze. The other grasslands, which offer amazing habitat for uh, um, butterflies and other animals, because you know the vegetation out there is so dense to have these nice openings for things uh, to do that need edge habitat, especially butterflies, um, was tremendous. And these balds or open spaces, there's a number of them on the park, and they're in varying conditions in terms of, of grazing in time. Another view of one of the balls. This is another grassland that I was running through. Um, I didn't get to pay too much attention to it. I was trying to catch up with subtle. Um, and I, I had to stop and collect the specimen because I'm like, this isn't needle and thread grass. What is this grassland? I've never seen anything like it. And it didn't look grazed or anything. So I collected a sample and took a picture and then cut it out. And then I contacted Dean Clark and some other people. And they're like, oh, that's pretty special. We need to go to the look at that again, and hopefully Dean and I will be out there next year uh, checking this grassland out. This is actually um, a tall grass prairie remnant, totally intolerant of grazing, and it's considered to be rare or quite infrequent, so pretty spectacular to find it out there. Yeah, interesting. Another interesting prairie plant that is globally secure, but getting to be quite rare in Colorado and it's losing its habitat quickly. It likes to live along the front range where we all like to live. Um, um, it is very sensitive to grazing and land development and habitat loss, which is, that's pretty much how you could describe the front range, unfortunately. So let's move on to wetlands. Yay. Uh, I mentioned that the wetland resources were pretty depopulated, but there are spots where you can find wetlands and streams and Things that support all kinds of wildlife on the property. This particular little pond, we were trying to visit as many ponds as we can to see if any of them were natural. And most of them were turning out to be springs that had been burned for 
watering cattle, but still beautiful nonetheless. Um, but a lot of these at the top of the springs, even though they're burned, they flow downward across the property and you get these little streams uh, that help support uh, rare species like the Mexican meadow jumping mice. They need lots of thick, dense vegetation. This is just another view of the variety of wetlands that we came across. Some are surrounded by woodlands, some aren't impacted by burning at all. Um, this one uh, uh, brings back terrifying memories because I call this the rattlesnake wetland because there was a rattlesnake. I don't know how many of us walked by it. This thing did not rattle. It wouldn't rattle at all. I don't mind rattlesnakes, but ones that don't rattle, uh, and especially in a patch of stinging metal, that would have been a great thing to step into. Two, two for the price of one. Nettles and a rattlesnake. Another type of wetland that there is actually uh, one of our track rare plant communities. It's considered globally vulnerable and safe for being perils. And that's the bed willow, Felix Bebiana wetland, wet shrubland community. Um, kind of interesting. Um, it's found only in narrow canyons, deep bed meadows that are protected from livestock grazing. We think that there'll be more of it found in the upper regions, like this one was found at Fisher State Park, but it's not fully yet, uh, mapped there yet. But bed willow is a pretty little willow. It has white. Uh, whitish bark and it kind of grows with a big multiple trunk going on and the leaves kind of look um, like leather and they're smaller than a lot of willow leaves so it's pretty distinctive uh, in this batch. Some willows aren't distinctive and hard to key out but not this one. <laughs> Yay. Okay so moving on to wildlife. Uh, I'm going to talk about the wildlife but I didn't participate in too many of the wildlife studies. As a matter of fact I went to ask Dave Leatherman what this beautiful grasshopper was here and he's like, well, it's not a grasshopper, it's called a Mormon cricket and it's actually a cave did. I'm like, I'm giving up on that identification. My skills is identifying bugs. We didn't run across some bear signs, some different types of bear signs, but this was our, I think it was one of our bat sonograms that had been visited by a critter. Well, this one's for you, Karen. This is the New Mexico Meadow Jumping Mouse, Zappas Pasonia Sleeves. Great picture by one of the interns here, Emma Ballinet. I had to steal a picture of a different meadow jumping mouse. The New Mexico Meadow Jumping Mouse um, isn't in the uh, northern part of Colorado. It's a more southern species in into New Mexico, but it is federally endangered. Uh, our ranking on this one is T1S1. There's a T there instead of a G because this is a subspecies, and so it's a taxonomic, uh, the tax, this taxon is considered critically imperiled and a state critically imperiled. And uh, it's one of those animals too that depends on a variety of habitats to survive. This particular animal is very habitat specific. I mean, you can start hunting for this animal just by looking for the habitat that it needs because you usually won't find it where you don't have. Uh, surface and groundwater flows of a certain hydrologic type. And it requires dense riparian vegetation. Why we don't, one of the reasons we don't have too many of these uh, critters anymore is because we like to put cattle in, and develop lands that have dense uh, riparian vegetation. And the connectivity to local populations is going to be very important for this species to survive. We're still doing surveys out here with the New Mexico meadow jumping mouse was found in two different drainages in 2019 and 2020, and uh, Rock Shore's already been out there this year uh, looking for more habitat to survey for next year. Um, this photograph here was taken of a Preble's Meadow jumping mouse, which is the more northern um, variety of this mouse, but they have incredibly long tails. You can almost recognize them in the field just because their tails are ridiculously long, and they jump. They're named jumping mouse. They're not kidding. They have large feet and they bounce. Um, I've seen them jump out of wood piles. It's just it's very cool. We need to protect the beautiful little species. They have a bicolored, bicolored tail and quite a long hibernation time. Some sources say up to as long as nine months. A Rob Shore says closer to seven to eight months, but still, that's a long time uh, for an animal that's been hibernating. This is the, the known distribution right now of the New Mexican meadow jumping mouse. This is New Mexico, this is Colorado, so you see it does get up into Los Angeles County and just some other southern counties, but it doesn't go very far north. This is the only known distribution, and it's not that common in all of the areas where it's been at. Uh, the Preble's Meadow jumping mouse doesn't get south of El Paso County 
and it does extend up into the central part of Wyoming. So from an iconic landmark to an iconic species, the peregrine falcon, a beautiful landmark that we see is actually home to an eyrie, a nesting site for the peregrine falcon. It's a fantastic bird, it's called a falcon because of its infamous diving speeds that can approach 200 miles per hour, considered a swamp tier two specimen. Um, it's a species of concern with like state, CLM, US Forest Service sensitive species. And it's ranked as state um, in peril by community. Um, the sad thing is, is that the area where this beautiful bird has its diary is also probably one of the few areas of stable rock. So that's going to be an interesting management um, issue for rock climbers and people who like birds and want to protect. It's a top carnivore. It's, it's, it's miraculous and wonderful that it's here. It means the quality of vegetation in and the landscape supports top predators. It's we need more lands that do things like that. There are actually three main birds that are of uh, conservation concern the pinion jay, which is a swap to the two, the tree nester, and a ground forager. So, again, you have this diverse array of habitats we need to protect our tree nesters and the populations that are managed in the county for the beautiful blue birds. And then there's the northern pygmy owl, which you just keep it around because it's so darn cute. Um, but don't let it fool you, it's a aerial feeder and songbirds that aren't much smaller than it is. So it's quite a pesky hunter. Um, it's considered globally, um, apparently secure, but state vulnerable in its uh, breeding. That's a So I thought I'd put this list in because you guys are the Audubon Society, but the partners in flight have also uh, a number of species of concern that we also found at Fisher State State Park. The band tailed pigeon, which I've never even heard of. Brewer's, Brewer's blackbird, common nighthawk, a few flycatcher, green tailed green tailed toady, grasshopper sparrow, bark bunting, azuli bunting, lazuli bunting, and I want to mountain bluebird, pine fishkin, Virginia's warbler, and my favorite, oven bird. So, a lot of interesting animals. And then there's the bat. The birds of the night. Um, PHP did uh, not only mist netting and sonogramming, but they also did rock climbing to look for bat roots. So we want our bat activity going on. And sometimes we did get some assistance setting up our bat detectors. The Lita Myers Admiral often set up in the word detectors. But we were able to verify eight species of bat. Five are at risk species, including a very rare fringe myotis, which is a tier one, one of our only tier one species, I think, and a hoary bat, which is a tier two. But I have pictured here a couple of the other rare species, the silver haired bat on the right here, the globally and state vulnerable bat species. And my favorite, the Townsend big eared bat, which has giant ears, it's also um, vulnerable. Uh, globally and statewide. And these ears are so large that they think it even helps with its flight. And then ears kind of fold up when it's um, roosting at night. It's an incredible bat. We have the crazy, family. crazy, beautiful. Of course, for bat conservation, one of the biggest threats is recreational climbing. And that's going to have to be addressed in a management plan, habitat loss, logging, agriculture, wind turbines. And uh, the white nose syndrome is something that's more prevalent out east, but that's not to say it couldn't fit in to the western places. So. Okay, so now we're going to do a quick little talk on butterflies. But it's hard to talk about entomology and not have a Gary Larson cartoon because he gives the best entomologic cartoon ever known. And I saw this and I'm thinking, I took this picture. I've actually taken this picture. And I have. This is John Fubble. He's our butterfly guy that did a lot of the butterfly work uh, at, for uh, the Pacific Park. I know Pam Gambino is working on butterflies out there as well. So one of the, there are eight families represented of butterflies, 76 taxa, five are regionally endemic species, and two African species, including the Lufona Hobblemot Zipper. And it's another species that's dependent on those nice openings. Uh, in the vegetation. And in those openings, it needs a specific uh, type of grass for a host, including 
uh, the gene poet and mechanical. So it's very important when we are trying to save creatures that we look around a little bit and make sure we save their entire habitat from fragmentation as we build roads and trails. So it's a nature serve, it's an imperiled species, and this is its distribution. Um, it's not really known what its ranking is in Mexico, but in Colorado, it's considered imperial. Then we have, um, I guess, a swap to two species the mountain checkered skipper. It likes high mountain clearings. Again, it likes these open spots. Um, it, the caterpillar and hosts are various species of potent toe. Some butterflies are very species specific, and you've got to make sure you protect the species because they're probably so long. This butterfly is considered very rare or local throughout its range, which is in Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona. This is not a rare butterfly, but boy, isn't this beautiful? A spectacular photograph by Christian Munoz, who also contributed to the plant list at um, British Peak State Park. Here it is perched on a musk um, It's considered to have a boreal distribution. It feeds the caterpillars feed on gooseberries and currants and even rhododendron. So seeing it's listening, I don't know if she's here, but we gotta look for rhododendron at Peter's Peak State Park. You never know. And the adults feed on two fat and then what a beautiful photo. There's another common butterfly that we admire as Admiral, we saw earlier, uh, visiting the OSHA for the rest of them fertilize flowers. I didn't mention, but there are speaking aspen, cottonwood, and willow, of course, at the park. And it's one of the butterflies that relies on them. Now we're going to jump from butterflies to mollusks. Who cares about mollusks? Well, we all should. They're one of the most imperiled groups of organisms. Um, Ten species were documented at Peter's Peak State Park. Is pretty cool considering the small number of wetlands available that could actually support them, including an at risk species. And um, our at risk species is Swamp Linnea, Linnea Stagnella, interesting little snail. Um, and the threats to it are significant to consider because they, they include water development and roads and trails, which are going to be the same, and surface facilities that can increase sedimentation and runoff. All these things are going to have to be considered as the part of the cells. And any uh, for reason, um, moths all over the world are disappearing. Is that the things that we do when we develop land are pretty much all these things we put through here. One of the cool parts of the whole study was that we had the interns with us in the evenings. It was nice to be able to share stories and teach uh, some of the interns how to like press plants and how conservation works and how surveys are done. So it was uplifting for us as well as for students. So as we start to wrap up here and we consider this beautiful landscape, um, I've been thinking a lot about David Attenborough and he, you know, has recently been talking a lot about his seven ways to save the planet. And one of the things he talks about is finding a way to turn wilderness into a viable thing for people who live on it while still protecting biodiversity. Boy, if this isn't going to be Hopefully, a theme for Fisher's Peak State Park. Um, I don't know what it is. It's amazing that the property has recovered, and he talks about landscapes recovering and if you give land enough time. And also, we have to learn to put people and planet before profit, much easier said than done, and track ecological impacts and human well being as a new measure of success. Hopefully, we'll turn a curve, and, and most of the calls to help protect our landscapes won't be. Mostly political, mostly some input, and, and so that we all can share this beautiful space while maintaining the biodiversity that's there. So that's that's what I got for tonight. Thank you, Pam. Yeah. So there are some questions in the chat about the geology. What can you tell us about that? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, the cliffs that you see, these tall cliffs behind here, are basalt. Um, and a lot of there's a lot of limestone found, uh, formations on the eastern slopes. Um, unfortunately, I don't have much more knowledge about that except the areas that I was doing surveys, which is basically on the limestone and up towards the basalt. So I, I can't share much more than that. But there's a variety, and uh, I wish I could tell you more. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, question about, is there any evidence of beaver? 
no. Well, I, I, I didn't do the zoological survey and there's no mention of it in the report that I helped write. I don't think there's water, enough water. Mostly there's small tributaries and springs. Um, in my estimation, there's nothing large enough to support beaver on that property. Okay. A uh, question from Pam Pambino. Uh, thanks for a great program. How, how big a problem is rare plant collecting on those cliffs? Well, uh, up until now, nobody's been able to access them. And uh, the species that are rare are out there aren't really the ones that uh, rare plant collectors usually target, which there are. So the species that rare plant finders target are like ferns and orchids. Um, so the species that are on those cliffs, I don't think are, I don't think anyone's going to collect that gray bug. Um, I think it's beautiful, but I don't think anybody would want that in the garden, maybe a rock garden, but it's been so inaccessible to people, it probably remains to be seen, but I sure hope people wouldn't want to. I can't think of anything that would be wildly collected up there, like a yellow lady slipper or something, that would be more worrisome. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions you can post to the chat or you can raise your little hand from the reactions button at the bottom of your zoom screen or just unmute and ask. Hi, Pam. Can you hear me? It's Pam Piombino. Hi, Pam. Hey, how are you? Good. Uh, good. Um, Anyway, um, I've been doing moth surveys, particularly along McBride Creek, which is down the southern portion. And I'd love to share my data with you and try to coordinate the rarer, rarer species I'm finding with the plants that are their larval host plants. Awesome. Yes. Uh, now would be a really good time to get together and talk about that um, because now we have money to work on next year's survey and um, we can get your list to John Subble and make sure it gets into the zoology uh, list. Uh, my report or our report that was written on the 2019-2020 survey hopefully will be posted on our website soon and it has the list of all the plants and animals that we found, um, not just the rare ones. So that would be a nice resource for people who want to visit uh, the park as well. My um, report did go to Chris Pegg and okay. Crystal Drayling, so, uh, and they forwarded out it on to other people in CPW. So it is out there somewhere, and I'm, I'm still working on this year's report. Okay, I'm going to check with John, too, and see if he's received your, your, point, or your moth list. <laughs> Hi, this, yeah. Go ahead, Carol. This is Carol. I just have a kind of an open ended musing about, you know, as we're in migration right now with all of our birds, you know, what kind of um, support this place is giving our migrating birds. I mean, since it's so uncluttered with development, I mean, is it an important area for migrating birds? Do we know what it's doing and how important is it and what? How can we protect it in that light? I mean, this is just an open-ended question, but I'd like to see us be thinking about what what birds are migrating through there. I don't know how we know this year, obviously, but um, maybe in the spring or the next fall, we you know kind of get out there and look to see what's coming through. Absolutely, and we could check in with some of the other people that did some of the bird surveys, like Kristen Union was paying attention to birds, um, John did birds. I think there's still, you know, two years is just not enough time, and this place is really huge, especially when you consider the terrain and all the seasons um, and how hard it is to get around out there. So you can't get to all the spots and see all the, the things in migration again. That's something that's going to take a while to answer. And there might be some people who know because there's the state wildlife areas on the main so um, Maybe someone in this audience knows who might have or might have the answer to your question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Question from the chat from Lillian. Uh, will more of the park be open to the public in the future? Oh yeah, that's the plan. I, 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 I can't say for sure, but I think they're planning on opening a lot of the park in the future. And right now 
it just takes a while to get the infrastructure in place so people can safely visit the park and get around the park. Um, I know I, it was fun to hear Karen Meany say that she really enjoyed her trip on that northern little sneak peek trail. Um, I'd like to see that. I haven't seen that yet. She got to see it before I did. <laughs> Other questions? It's exciting to me to see that we, um, you know, can do something uh, co collaboratively at, you know, it's kind of a, it seems like a big deal to um, have a new state park um, and to see what kind of, uh, you know, wild looking landscape that is. Um, it, it's, it's exciting to me that we still have those places in the state and we are, can work together to protect them. Yeah. It's fabulous, and, and uh, w when you think of all the people that maybe hopefully we can all come together and, and find ways to make the best use. And, and I think the most fascinating thing I've learned from doing the survey is how much recovery has taken place in 100 years. I was sort of shocked to learn that it had been clear cut basically, uh, then I, because I didn't know that until after I'd already been out there for a couple of seasons. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. It didn't look like a place that had been clear cut. It looked recovery. That's great. I'd, I'd love to ask one more question. Um, Pam, how confident are you that all the research that you and the other scientists are doing can um, keep people uh, out of the most sensitive areas? Yeah, well, I know that uh, the CPW is working very hard to protect these species. Um, I don't have I don't know how to tell for sure what's going to be protected. I was a little bit heart sick when I realized that, you know, probably one of the prime climbing areas is where the peregrine eyrie is. And it's like, oh, and that's where we were finding some of the rare plants. Um, it's not that big of an area really. And uh, there's there's I don't know. I don't know how they're gonna balance it. We haven't mapped out, I think, all of the climbing areas. Uh, some of our people were out there mapping areas to see what was safe for climbing. And uh, uh, it's interesting, a lot of the bats were found on the more stable rocks. They were more uh, actually on the least stable rock formation. So I don't know how they're going to strike this balance uh, over time. I have little faith because it seems like an end politics seems to rule over natural resources. So hopefully uh, people will realize what a gem we have here and we'll all be able to work together so that everyone can enjoy the park without uh, putting a strain on this amazing biodiversity that we found. It's, we're also out of, tape, out of touch with how a landscape like this is good for the whole region of Trinidad in terms of water quality protection, you know, clean air, clean water, uh, fire protection. These, these lands uh, fight, they can, they're, more, they're less susceptible to fires than other landscapes. And, um, they're also much more resilient against climate change. And, and it's, uh, some of the new research that's coming out on fragmentation and trails is showing that sometimes some of these hiking trails and things are much more harmful than we think. They have a, a much more, a greater impact than we thought they did. You know, to have a whole bunch of humans across the landscape, there's no doubt there's gonna be an impact, but hopefully, it can be developed to minimize uh, what will be impactful when you're going to put thousands and thousands of people that want to visit, you know, 30 square miles. I saw a note on, on the uh, park website that said uh, one of the trails that's being worked on or has been uh, developed was based on a road and uh, had had grades up to 30%. So that'll keep a lot of us out of <laughs> that, that trail. <laughs> That's quite a climb. Yeah, it's a serious park. I mean, there's very few places that are flat. Even the balls are tipped at an angle sometimes. It's, the topography is serious. Flat would not be a word you, you would ever use to describe that park. <laughs> Pam, I realized I have another question. This is Karen. Um, do you know if, if ringtails showed up? Uh, they aren't on the list. Um, okay. Have they been found from there before? Um, no, I mean, I don't think anything's been found there much because no, you know, it's I, I haven't, the ringtails are not on the animal list that I know. Okay. Okay. But boy, no reason they couldn't be there. 
Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> yeah. I love their other name, Caco Missile. <laughs> I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Better, better than Herikia Horida. <laughs> yeah. There's a comment in the chat that many people are interested in uh, hiking and climbing the peak. So there will be there will be a group who wants to tackle that 30% grade. Yeah, there will be. And you know, when you get there and you get near the cliffs, I mean you can't help yourself. You you want to go there. Um, you, you just want to if people are gonna want to be there. I don't know what you do with that. Educate people and manage it as carefully as we can, and hopefully, um, the work that CPW is putting a lot of uh, effort and time and money into figuring out where all these resources are, and um, hopefully, that they're going to use that strategically to place the trails. Thanks. I have a question about how you assemble a team of people to do this kind of work. Um, you know, you mentioned people from, um, you know, other organizations besides your own um, university and so on. Uh, how do you, how do you recruit folks to go out and spend that kind of time in the field? Um, and, well, we were uh, one of the group, Phoenix P was re recruited. We brought a, a grant and then we're out there, but they, um, the Nature Conservancy and some of the other partners also recruited people to come out there and do surveys. Like, I don't, I don't know who Pam's working for or, uh, she's doing it for CPW, but they're the ones who kind of recruited other people. Um, when I start going out there, people like Dina Clark are like, hey, can I come? And I'm like, hey, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're for Acrofield. Of course, uh, more eyes on the ground, more knowledge base for Colorado, and especially uh, Dina Clark's expertise in Southeast Colorado is tremendous and a wonderful gift to an area that hasn't really been botanically surveyed. So um, it just kind of happened. Great. For folks who don't know, Dina is the herbarium manager at C. Boulder. Oh, thank you. For the museum. So, so she's quite an expert on this stuff. And then, yeah, she must be able to persuade her boss to let her get out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Pam. This was fantastic. It looks like a great place to visit. I, I think a lot of us are intrigued now yeah. um, in a place we didn't know much about, perhaps. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. You bet. <laughs>